Okay, because, yeah, so today's lecture, let me end uh, the, quickly the example I was telling you about the projective plane. And then, to be honest, I was dreaming of telling you something about differentiable manifolds and differential geometry, but being the last lecture, it would become just a mess. So uh, today's lecture will be just closing this example, having a quick discussion, and then I would prefer to discuss with you exercises and problems about the course, the whole course, okay? So it will be a special, strange lecture, okay? I warn you right from the beginning. Well, the, the end of the story about the, the, the projective plane was this. We, we defined one differentiable structure, even though we, we presented it in two different ways on P2R, okay? Essentially, one was coming naturally, looking at it as R3 minus the origin quotient by the equivalence relation. And the other was thinking of it as the quotient of S2 modulo the antipodal map. Okay? This induced naturally two seemingly different differentiable structures here, but it's easy to check that they are actually diffeomorphic. Okay? You can write one, diff one change of charts in, an, in, the, in the first differentiable structure in terms of a chart of the second structure, and you see this is a differentiable map, and vice versa, okay? That means that the differentiable structures are really the same, okay? And then I mentioned to you the problem that um, whether a differentiable manifold comes actually as a submanifold of, uh, of Euclidean space, and this object here, fails to be a submanifold of R3. It's, we can call it a surface in the sense it's a two-dimensional manifold, but uh, it's impossible to embed it inside R3. So um, the idea is just to, I mean, if we want to have some uh, simple model of this. On the other hand, I mentioned to you Whitney's theorem. It's, uh, I didn't tell you the name last time. So there's a famous theorem by, by Whitney of mid-40s, beginning of the 40s, um, telling you that every differentiable manifold is in fact a submanifold of every compact, every compact differentiable manifold is a submanifold of a sufficiently big dimensional Rn, okay? And in fact, in general, if you take an n-dimensional manifold, compact n-dimensional manifold, this will always embed inside R2n plus 1, okay? So this is kind of the, the estimate we have for, for the dimension of the Euclidean space where you can see n-dimensional manifolds. So applied to surfaces, this would give R5. And I mean, it's usually not easy to prove that something cannot be embedded in one it's not, it's not a simple problem. On the other hand, let me show you why P2R goes inside R4, which is actually less than the general dimension, okay? Well, the way to do it is to construct a map, which I call phi. Look at phi from R3 to R4, given by these functions. Okay, you take x, y, z, and you go into, si into x squared square minus y squared, uh, x, y, x, z, y, z. You see, basically you are taking a, a subset of polynomials of degree 2 in the variables, okay, in the variables x, y, z. And remember that P2R actually, so, um, you see, if you think of P2R as the quotient of R3 minus the origin, quotient, the equivalence relation given you by multiplication of a non-zero number, this map doesn't pass to the quotient, okay? Because the point, the equivalence class X, Y, Z would, be, I mean, a point X, Y, Z will be equivalent to lambda X, lambda Y, lambda Z. But the image of lambda x, lambda y, lambda z is not. It's completely different. Okay, but well, it will be lambda squared. But it's not the same point. Here we don't have an equivalence relationship. Okay, so this is not a map which passes automatically to the quotient. 
The way to see, the way to correct this problem is to look at this map, uh, to look at this map uh, on, uh, on S2. Okay. Because what is the difference, of course? Which are the, which is the equivalence relationship on S2 which gives you the projective plane is the antipodal map. So P minus P are the only two representative of a given equivalence class. Okay? But P and minus P will go to the same point. Okay? Because if I take minus X minus Y minus Z, these are quadratic polynomials and they kill the minus. Okay? So this map goes... When I see, when I restrict it to, um, so on S2, phi passes to the quotient. To the quotient giving P to R. So in fact, the quotient map, I can, I can define the quotient map, if, let me call it theta, if you want. So there is a map from P to R into R4, okay? This will be formally the quotient map of phi, okay? So now the claim is that this is actually an embedding, okay? Well, what do you have to check? You have to check many things. Most of them are completely in fact, almost all are completely trivial in the sense that, for example, is this map injective, first of all? Well, that's simple. Okay, you, you assume, suppose that there are x, y, z, and uh, x tilde, y tilde, z tilde going into the same thing, and then you, you have to argue that the two points are, differ by a minus. Okay, that the only possibility is that they differ by a minus, for example. Then, well, is it continuous? Well, this map is certainly continuous because it's a differentiable map on R3, restricted to S2, quotient. So with the quotient topology, this is by definition a continuous map. Okay. Then what else? Well, then, is it differentiable? Well, to check if, if a map on a differentiable manifold is differentiable, you have to write it in terms of a chart. Okay. But in terms of a chart, which chart, for example, now we have two, two nice sets of charts in some sense because we have defined two, two possible ways to describe the differentiable structure of this object. In terms of, remember, in terms of the maps of the charts given by from the disk to the sphere, okay, when we described it in the second way, we defined, for example, the map F3+, plus, you know, which was taking the disk into the upper sphere in the, with respect to the coordinate z. So that means it's taking the point x, y and giving you x, y square root of 1 minus x squared minus y squared, okay, with a plus here. Otherwise, there was a minus here, okay? So this was one, for example, one possible chart. From the disk, you know, x, y move in the disk x squared plus y squared less than 1 and gives me this point here, okay, on, on S2. On, on, the, on a part of S2 where each point has only one equivalent point. It's, it's equivalent only to itself. Okay? So I see this map with values in P to R. Okay? So now how do I check that the map is differentiable? Well, I write phi composed F3 plus, for example. Of course, I should do it for any i and plus and minus, but they are all the same, okay? up to change of names and putting a minus somewhere, okay? So what, what does this become? This becomes the map, uh, right, this becomes the map x squared, because now you take this point and you have to, 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 to compose with this map here. So this becomes x squared minus y squared, x, y, and then let me just say, every time I see a z, I call this function here d. Okay, just to give it a short name, and this becomes x d y d. Okay, so this is the composition. So there are questions here. Of course, this is another way to check that this is a differentiable map, okay, because now I, I wrote it in terms of a chart. So the, I wrote the map phi in terms of the chart. 
and I see it's still a differentiable map. Now, now the problem is, for example, is the differential injective? Remember, I'm trying to prove that this is an embedding, so I need to prove that the differential is injective. Okay. Is the differential injective? Well, the differential, I need to compute d of phi composed f3 plus at any given point. Okay, I leave the point free because it has, it has to be true at every point. So, well, but this object here now is a map from R2 to R4. Okay, because now this goes from the disk to R4. So the tangent, the tangent space to the disk is R2, and this goes to the tangent space to R4, which is R4. So this is represented by what? Is represented by the Jacobian matrix, by the matrix give, which I construct by taking partial derivatives in, 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 uh, in the rows, for example. No? So if I take, so on the first row I put the partial derivative with respect to x. So this becomes 2x, y, uh, y. Uh, d plus x dx, y dx. Remember, d is a function of x and y, so I leave, I indicate by the partial derivative as usual. And then I take in the second row, I put the derivatives with respect to y, so this becomes minus 2y, x, x dy, d plus y dy. Okay, and now the question is, it has this matrix rank 2 at every point? Because now this is of dimension 2, and the requirement of being in a dimension is that the differential is injective. So it has to have maximal rank, and the maximal rank here is 2. Okay, is it 2 or not? Well, you see, it's enough to, to look here. No? This minor... It's twice x squared plus y squared, okay? So, so that's okay away from zero, 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 okay? Zero, zero is inside our domain because we are taking x and y in the disk, okay? So this would be a nice minor except from zero, and then you, you look for another one, okay? And then what else? Well, you need to, what would need really to prove, so it's clearly, so it's a differentiable map, is an immersion, is one to one, it's continuous, well, you, you would need to prove that it's an homeomorphism onto its image, okay? I skip this, it's purely topological problem, okay? That's the only bit missing. Okay. In any case, this was just a, an exercise in, uh, in this. Okay, that, now as I said... P2R is compact. P2R is compact. Okay, yeah, if you want, you can use even, you can bypass the problem in this form, okay? Yeah. Now, as I said, I was dreaming of telling you more about the beginning of the story on differentiable manifold, but I, let, I hope you realize that all the things we have done for surfaces have been already done in a way to prepare you to jump to this more general setting, okay? Now, there are, of course, points where things get delicate, which we didn't really see in the, th in the theory of surfaces because using the fact that there was an R3 around, we could bypass the problem going out from the surface into R3. For example, orientability. I mean, a key point, a key thing that you want to do on a manifold is, of course, integration. Okay, you, have, you would like to do two things, differentiated and integrate if you want to have a reasonable calculus on a manifold. For example, to integrate, we need orientation. Now, orientation, orientation in R3, for surfaces in R3, was easy to bypass by, say, by asking that there was a globally defined normal vector field. 
Okay, this was a way to say that something was oriented. But of course, if your manifold is an abstract manifold, it doesn't live anywhere. Okay, you don't. It doesn't make any sense to to speak about the normal vector. So how can you solve the problem of this? Well. That's, a, for example, another point where you really think of what you need and you put it as a definition, but then you re it's interesting to realize that this is exactly what you had in mind for surfaces in R3. Namely, for example, the problem of orientation is, that, is to ask that your manifold, is, of course, it's always covered by charts, this by definition, and you know that when you overlap, there is a differentiable function, okay, in the, in the other picture from here, the usual picture, Basically, you ask that this function here has positive Jacobian, okay? So this is another way to say that they are, these two charts are oriented in the same way, okay? And in fact, this corresponds precisely to the fact that, remember when you did xu cross xv on one side, so if you had two charts and y u tilde wedge, you had the two two things. Well, of course, the fact that these two things match corresponds exactly to the fact that the Jacobian of the transformation giving you, for example, the y in terms of dx is positive. Because here, the only thing that can happen if you think of R3 around this object is that your normal vector, when you pass to the other chart, becomes minus it. So being positive, the Jacobian is exactly the fact that the, norm, the standard normal vector on one chart goes to the standard normal vector in the other chart. Well, of course, normalized, okay? I'm not asking to be equal to one because actually here there is divided by the norm, so the only thing I care is if it's positive or negative, okay? You see, this is, an, this, for example, it's another point where you have to stop and think. If you give this other definition, so an orientable manifold will be a differentiable manifold which is covered by charts in such a way that every time two charts overlap, the Jacobian is positive. Okay. In the case of, of surfaces, this boils down to the old definition. Okay. But this condition is exactly what you need to define an integral. Okay. Because the Jacobian of the transformation is exactly what appears in the change of variable formula for integrals. Okay. Up to the absolute value. That's the kind of the problem. So when you want to give the notion of the integral of something, in principle, it would be defined up to a plus minus, okay? Because of this problem. If you know that your manifold is orientable, this problem disappears, okay? I'm not trying to, but this, this is another moment where, so integration of what? But actually the, the other problem is what can you integrate on a manifold? And there, that was I was hoping to tell, I mean, to describe you quickly, but it's impossible. So differential forms, whatever, if you, if you know it already, that's, that's kind of the, the, the natural object to integrate on a manifold, okay? Now, now what else? Well, so as I said, this is just the beginning of the story. Basically, we did the first maybe 15 pages of any book in uh, introduction to differential geometry. Then how things go on? Well, you see that even just by having the definition, you have some beautiful questions that you can think of. So for example, this notion of differentiable structure. The differentiable structure induces a topological structure. You, do, you haven't stopped me, but clearly it's, it's a question that it's behind our mind. Is it possible for two differentiable structures to induce the same topology, and not, but they are not diffeomorphic? The meaning, the association from differentiable structure to topological structure. Is it injective in some sense? Notice that the two equivalence relationships are different because on differentiable structure you identify diffeomorphic things. On topological spaces you identify homeomorphic things. So basically the question is, is it possible that two homeomorphic manifolds are not diffeomorphic? So, you see, this is, uh, and this is already a beautiful piece of mathematics. So you don't need, the point is, okay, the, the question is simple, it's beautiful, it's fundamental, but the answer is highly non-trivial, okay? It turns out 
that this kind of, because for, you see, for example, for surfaces, you can prove that this is not possible. Two surfaces are homeomorphic if, and not, if, if they have a differentiable manifold. Two surfaces are homeomorphic if and only if they are diffeomorphic. So you need to go in higher dimension to, to understand whether this is possible or not. And, and the answer is actually yes. This was a great surprise. Even for compact manifolds, and in fact, even for uh, very simple topological manifolds. So Milner, John Milner, which is probably a name you find, you found that in many places in mathematics. John Milner, when he was very horribly young, proved that even among spheres, you can put, so if you take Sn, if you start from 7, these topological spaces have differentiable structure which are not diffeomorphic. Okay? This was really a surprise. Okay? And these are called exotic structures, of course. You, know, you will find even books on, on, on this, on the description of this. So, of course, if the sphere has it, you can produce it on many other compact manifolds. But then there was a second, so this was about 1954, if I remember well. Okay? But then there was a second part of the story, because you say, okay, but maybe you have to go in very high dimension and you have to take, what about Euclidean spaces? So. If, if this phenomenon happens, you can ask, does it happen on the simplest possible manifold? I mean, this is the simplest compact manifold. What about Rn? Okay, so you fix the Euclidean topology. Well, no, you, you don't fix the you, Are there topological structure which admit, which come from differentiable structure, structures? And as topological spaces, they are homeomorphic, but as differentiable manifold, they are not diffeomorphic. Okay? Well, this is, was even a bigger surprise. Okay? Because the answer is again yes, and not, but in this case, it's a, yeah, it's a very strange yes. Because exotic structures exist on, on, uh, on Rn only in dimension 4. Okay? So for a, only for n equal to 4, these structures exist. And in fact, in dimension 4, there are infinitely many, more than countable many, okay? such structures. Okay? And this was a beautiful theorem by Donaldson well, and Friedman. Okay, this was about 1980. Okay, so even R4, which is one of the most familiar things you can think of, produces this incredible phenomenon, okay? And there is still a lot of research to try to understand what is the geometry of these manifolds, okay? They are generally manifolds. For example, so this is another, uh, one way, uh, even w just with the things that we have just defined, it's enough to, to produce. Uh, but then, just to indicate, you may, probably many of you have already studied something that is close to what I'm saying. So the game, what, what is the game in this, I mean, is to try to associate, so to classify manifolds under special assumption, you know? Like we did, for example, curvature, I mean, curvature condition, how curvature condition on a surface determine which surface it is, you know? So for example, a surface of constant Gauss curvature, a compact surface of constant Gauss curvature in R3 is a sphere, okay, for example. Okay? Or we did the classification even when it's not positive. Okay? So this type of theorems. Well, in differential geometry, what you try to do, you see differentiable manifolds are too flexible. I mean, you cannot really, I mean, they are very difficult to classify in the sense that Di di uh, differentiable, there are too many differentiable maps. Okay? Differentiable maps are really flexible. You can stretch and push a manifold wherever you want, almost. So, 
the, the nice, the beautiful and difficult thing is to associate to a manifold some numbers. Think, think to the case of a surface, when we associate to a surface, a compact surface, the Euler characteristic, for example. This is the prototype game. Okay? You have a geometrical object and you associate a number. And then you ask, is it true that this number classifies? So is it true that if you have, I mean, this number must be invariant, for example, he, in this case for homeomorphism, okay, so it's a topological number. And then you dream of a theorem that tells you if two surfaces have the same number, they are homeomorphic. That this association is somehow uh, in injective, okay? And in the case of surface, compact orientable surfaces or compact non-orientable surfaces, remember, but you cannot mix the two together, this is true, okay? Two compact orientable surfaces with the same Euler characteristic are in fact the same. So if you want to mimic this, so this is beautiful, I mean, this is great, okay? In terms, I mean, for a geometer, this is the best you can hope, okay? At least as a first, as a first step. Is there a, a similar game you can produce here? Well, there are many of these type of games, okay? One, for example, I mean, you know some algebraic topology, you can associate groups instead of a number, no? You can, for example, you can associate to, to a topological space its first fundamental group. Okay. And then you, the dream is, if two objects have the same, I mean, abstractly isomorphic no, groups, corresponding groups, then they are the same. Okay. Well, in general, this is not true, of course. But you see, for example, even, even with the first fundamental group, if you restrict yourself to closed surfaces, compact surfaces. If you want, you can bypass. I mean, you, cannot you do not have to invent a new proof. But if you, if you believe the theorem that a surface with a given Euler characteristic is given by a sphere attaching handles, no? As more or less, I mean, the, 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 the Euler characteristic is measuring by 2 minus 2G. G is the number of holes of a surface. Then it becomes also true that the first fundamental group, I mean, two surfaces with, with two different number of holes will have two different fundamental groups. For example, the sphere will have fundamental group trivial, the group one. Okay? Every loop in the, on the sphere on S2 collapses continuously to a point. Okay? If you take a torus, one, one hole, what, what will be the first fundamental group of this? You have two independent generators, and there are no relationship between them, okay? There are no abstract relationship between two, these two loops, okay? So it's a Z plus Z. So you see, in this case, so for closed compact surfaces, again, for example, orientable by you can rephrase the first fundamental group determines the surface, okay? But again, in general, is it true if you go to higher dimension, for example? Well, for example, even in dimension three, this was the content of one of the most famous problem in mathematics, what it was called the Poincaré conjecture. If you take a compact three-dimensional manifold whose first, fundamental, whose first fundamental group is trivial, so restrict yourself to the simplest case, so no holes. So suppose you have a manifold, compact three manifold, whose first fundamental group is trivial. What can you say? Well, Poincaré asked, in fact, he asked it in any dimension, okay? Is it, uh, it but, but then if you go in, high, in dimension higher, you have to start putting also the higher homotopy type trivial, okay? So in dimension three, there is only one left, which is pi one. Otherwise, I, I think you have seen in the, in, the, in the course of algebraic topology that there are higher homotopy, okay? In any case, so in any dimension, you would ask, if, if something has trivial homotopy, okay, is it a sphere? This was the content of the Poincaré conjecture, okay? And this turns out to be true, okay? And it was proved, it's a beautiful, I mean, 
this is, in my opinion, is probably the most beautiful theorem in, in geometry that I know. Okay? Also, be, also for, because of the way it was proved, because it's very surprising. So in, at the end of the 60s, it was proved for any dimension greater than or equal to 5. And in fact, now we, we all kind of believe that this is easy. <laughs> It's, it, it was one of the triumphs of Morse theory, okay? With, with some Morse theory, with some delicate, but I mean, not Morse theory, you can prove the Poincaré conjecture in any dimension greater or equal to five. So some, in some sense, the problem in dimension 1,500,000 is much, much easier than in dimension four, where you can think that maybe with some compute. In fact, it's much, much, much easier than in dimension three, where you can even try to draw a picture, okay? Almost, I mean, drawing a three-dimensional manifold is not as easy as a surface, but in, I mean, you can get some geometric idea, okay? So, so in the, by Stevens Mail, Stevens Mail proved, I mean, of course, all these people, each of these theorems is a Fields medal, no? I mean, these are kind of milestones in, in geometry. I mean, these are not theorems like anything else. Now, Steve, Stevens Mail got the Fields medal for this theorem, and then in dimension four, with the very ad hoc four-dimensional proof, Friedman got the field medal for the solution for S4. And then it was left three dimensions. Strangely enough, this was resisting every, every attack. And this was proved in 2000. Well, unfortunately, there is not really a date, because probably you know it's a strange story. Somewhere between 2003 and 2006 by Grisha Perelman, okay? Using partial differential equations, essentially, technique. Okay, this was the, the, really the masterpiece of mixing analysis and geometry and topology all together. I mean, even though what I said would be true also for this part of the story. Here, when you get to this level of questions, mathematics is one. I mean, you, know, you cannot say, I'm a topologist, I'm an algebraist, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an analyst. I mean, here you have to use mathematics at full power, okay? And that's why it's also beautiful, okay? Now, the story was slightly complicated because, of course, Perelman was, well, he had his ideas about the way to communicate science. So he posted on the web two preprints, well, two papers. He didn't want to publish them, which is the usual way the ma mathematical community decides whether a paper is correct or not. Or, I mean, he just put on the web two papers and he disappeared, okay? And in fact, in those papers, the, there is not even the statement, of, it, he was not even claiming the Poincaré conjecture. He was proving something that everybody knew. It was very closely related to the Poincaré conjecture, but he, he was not even bothered by saying, then the Poincaré conjecture is proved. So the mathematical community was kind of shaked to say, well, now what do we do? I mean, first, are these theorems correct or not? And so many teams of mathematicians all, all over the world started working to check whether what he did was correct, and then how to use these theorems. That was kind of the easiest part in some sense, but I mean, how to use these theorems to, f to finish the proof of the Poincaré conjecture and that was done, okay? So in 2006, there was the International Mathematical Congress, which is the moment where it, it happens every four years. So it was the moment where we give, I mean, the community gives Fields Medal to, and it was proposed that Perelman would have gotten a Fields Medal for that, but he refused, okay? He didn't want to get prizes for that. He was kind of, he did what he did. I mean, he did it for his own, I mean, for the advancement of science, okay, and not for getting a prize, which is, I mean, if you want, it's kind of strange, but it's noble. I mean, we have to admire him also for this, because actually attached to the Poincaré conjecture, there was a $1 million prize. And he, to refuse $1 million, I mean, it's, <laughs> these days, it's something that deserves, I mean, respect, okay? <laughs> Well, especially because he was not the son of a gas uh, tycoon in Russia. I mean, he was an absolutely normal person with the problems of every normal person, okay? <laughs> anyway. Uh, okay, so for example, you see, but going back to now, end of, end of gossip. Going back to, 
I hope I'm trying to, I'm communicating you a strategy. I mean, classifying manifolds, how you try to classify manifolds. You try to associate to manifolds numbers or groups or vector spaces or something where you can think that, I mean, the classification of the other object is much easier. For example, if it's a finite group, you have the classification of finite groups. If it's a vector space of finite dimension, in fact, it's R to that dimension, okay? So you don't even have to classify anything. So in that case, of course, the only interesting thing would be the dimension. And then, and then you reverse, so the, there is a first part where you construct this object, so there is this association. And then there is the problem of is the how, how delicate the association is. I mean, two manifolds with the same objects associated are the same or not, okay? And this game goes on since it's, it's already a century that this goes on, and it will go on probably for another century, if not forever, okay? Because, of course, we, we have not identified numbers, so de such delicate numbers to tell us, well, if these numbers are the same, then the manifold is one of these, okay? There are many of these attempts, and every time we, so for every time we have a list, we separate parts of the list into smaller pieces and so on, but, I mean, this is part of current research in this general philosophy. The first game you would do in differential geometry is to associate what is called a cohomological, co homology, homology and cohomology, okay? But that's another, that's the story. For example, the RAM cohomology, it's a way to associate to a manifold a vector space, I mean, a, a vector space and, uh, okay. But there is definitely no way that in 40 minutes I can give you an idea on this. Um, well, okay, so in some sense I think the course is over and in the second part of this lecture I would like to discuss with you problems, okay, exercises. Okay, so now let's go back to some of the exercises I proposed to you during the course. So I'm asking you, one of your colleagues, to help me doing it, okay? Now, the exercise asks basically to classify isometries of the helicoid, okay? So, let's see how, how we do it. So the first question is to, to prove that K is, the Gauss curvature is given by this formula, okay? How do we do it? Okay, we use the formula for it. Okay. Okay, so just to save a bit of time, now there are basically two possibilities. Either you go on to compute little e, little f, little g, or you notice that you have fallen in one of the lucky cases of the Theorema Egregium, okay, and you, you, you take this function and you apply it in the, in the formula giving the Gauss curvature which comes up from the Theorema Egregium and assume, okay, and and you get this function, one minus, right. Okay. Okay, let's, uh, so now, since now we, we reduced it to just computing a derivative, this is the output. Okay, so let's move to the second question. 
Okay. The second question asks if uh, that if you take a point, if you have an isometry, and if you take a point and its image point, they lie at the same distance from the z-axis. Okay. So how how do we argue for this? So if I take any point I know it's, I can write it in this formula. Mm -hmm. So we, we can write any point. Uh, sorry, I repeat because of yes. the microphone. Okay. We can write any point. On this we write any point as the also image the of. The image also can be written in the same way. Like some of some YouTuber and YouTuber depending on this unit. Okay, there will be another choice of parameters for which this is true. So let's have the distance between P and its the z axis. And give me, if I use this formula to give mm -hmm. exactly this. Uh -huh. And the distance between f of p and the z axis will give me also epsilon of z tilde. Okay. But from here, you know that k of p is exactly k of f of p. So this will be the So by the theorem I gradient, you, we know that these two points must have the same so Gauss curvature. This will give you Okay, so this was a direct application of the theorem I gradient essentially. Okay. Now, now in fact, because of course the, 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 the exercise would be write down all the isometries. Okay, so the, all these steps are to to get to the final point. So now let's prove another intermediate step. So. F, in fact, so what, 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 what the, the exercise suggests is that F acts as a, as a translation on the z-axis, okay? Possibly after a reflection. So what, let's see how, how we can argue about this. Your U is very, very similar to a Y. Okay, okay. well, call it T. T. Mm -hmm. and this we can see it is exactly when we put V to zero, X of U zero. Okay, this is, uh, these are the points of the form. Okay. So if we restrict F, on this one, so we have a map equal to z, uh, because any element here is unity determined by this t. Mm -hmm. So x, j, t, plus we see f of x, t, zero. Okay. No. Basically, we are looking, this is kind of the restriction of the isometry on the, on the z axis. Now, from here first, you look at that. Well, Mm, I said it a bit brutally because we still don't know that the point on the z-axis stays on the z-axis. So, but let's now, see. From this one, we know that the distance between p and f of p with respect to the z-axis, they are the same. So here, I know that for any element, for all t element of r, the distance between x of t0 and the z-axis is 0. Exactly. So in fact, this answers my problem because that means that if I take a point on the z-axis, this will stay on the z-axis. So this map G is, in fact, I can write the map G as a map from R to R, if you want. Okay. This will give me that we have the distance between the of T and the z-axis. Okay. So from here, I know that this thing, I can write it as x of some Okay. Yes, for some function k. Okay. 
So now from here, what I have, I have g prime. Give me if I use this formula, this is f composed of x squared to u at t zero, mm -hmm. and this using this one, this will give me exactly zero zero t. Okay. Now f is an isometric, so it preserves the first fundamental form. Mm -hmm. So what I have, I know that e at t zero is exactly the norm. Mm -hmm. And this gives me at t u zero. I have this is one. So this gives me one. This is exactly this one. This is half of the value of the prime of t for all t. Okay. So this gives me my using continuity of t. So I have either p of t, p prime of t is exactly one for all t element of r or Now, with this one, we obtain that it is a translation. So, right. so that means k of t is equal to? Yes. If k of prime of t equals 1 for all t. Right, OK, OK. That's not, I mean, that means that k of t is equal to plus or minus t plus c. Plus c, OK. Plus some constant. And that's exactly what he had to prove because the minus sign here is exactly the reflection in the z axis on the z equal to zero axis. Okay? So we also achieved point three in our staircase. Now point four maps a ruling to a ruling. Well, actually, I don't know if we use the word ruling in the same way in, during my lectures. Of course, this means just, so this, this is a ruled surface, okay? So that means just it maps one of these lines to one of, to an, possibly another of these lines, okay? Maybe we can erase this, okay? Let's see if this space is enough. Yeah. If you can speak a bit louder, okay. I think. From this expression, you can write x of u v as u out plus j j u plus v cos of u sine zero. So if I denote this as alpha of u plus v. Any ruling is this one x of uv uv element of r. So now is to prove that the image of this. So the written in mathematical form, what you are asking is: Is it true that f of l u is equal to l u tilde, um, or for some u tilde? For some u -tilde. Okay. Now that we have translated the problem into mathematical terms. So, so I fix you. Or you fix you, yes. Fix. Mm -hmm. so if I define rest f on this set, yes. so we have f of v. Now here f is u is fixed, is v which is moving. So I, I know that any element can be written in this form. Mm -hmm. So this can be written as some d one of v cos of d two of v. So x d one of v d two of v. Why d one and v two in which function? Mm -hmm. So now from 
Okay, I can, if I call this one, so H is better. So I have H of E is X of D1 and D. D2 and D. So the difference, H part of D will give me, if I put this one inside here. Now, U is fixed. Mm -hmm. See, V which is more here. So this is. So if I use the first display quality, I have this prime or V is equal to this one because here U is fixed, this V which is one here. If I use this equality, this will give me so from here I have that the norm of S prime of V is exactly the norm of F composed to square. And this using the fact that F is an isometry. This is exactly f theta that we have. This is exactly f at u v. Sorry, may I? But may I interrupt you because it seems yes. to me we are taking a, a, a route which is too long. We know already that the map f preserves distances from the z-axis. Okay, so in, you already know the function g2. So what you have is g2 is a, the only thing you have is g2 of this square is exactly this square. Right. So it's plus or minus. Yes. Okay. Wouldn't wouldn't it be easier to use this information right from the beginning? And yes. Okay. You can, for example, assume it's plus. No, I mean, of course, the difference between plus and minus. The only problem is when it's zero. No, that I mean. So if you assume it's plus and you are not on v equal to zero, you can argue. Then, you, you, the, of course, the same proof will work when, v, when, when this is minus v and you are away from zero. But then the, the zero case you have already dealt on a side. So somehow you don't have to worry about the fact that you change. So in some sense, I think if you write that, I mean, without loss of generality, you can assume g2 is the identity. Mm -hmm. So this will give us H and it is exactly X of D and D. D. Right. And this is if I put inside, okay. This is V cos of D and D. So here you have the norm of this point of this curve is exactly d1 prime square. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
of u v. Now here we fix u. Mm -hmm. So we have also that's also this is f composed to x respect to v at u v. Now this is the law of this line square. It is that the law of f One. Okay. This is one. So that is equal to one. G prime is equal to zero. Call it, call it D, I don't know, just to avoid confusion with this. D. is constant. OK. So if you put it, put it back inside, what you have is. Well, OK, now, now it's, uh, it's OK. Because you are just changing uh, U into another thing, which is constant. OK, so it's done. OK. And now let's put everything together and give the classification of isometries. So what have we learned out of, out of these? So what we have is you can tell this this of of D plus sorry U. We know that this one, if we suppose that U U is fixed, it will take two. Sorry, this is a U. Yes. U. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Okay. Okay. We know that this one from the second question, this takes the volume to another volume. So if we saw that this was fixed, this should be normally alpha of some u, but depending on this u, which is fixed, plus. I think it's it would be more clear if you call it b of u. I mean, f by by the previous question, you know that u goes into something like this. But here, what is not written here is that, of course, everything could, could possibly depend on u. Exactly. OK, so let's call it b of u. OK. Now here, you have told you that this v, the v is either this one or minus. So if you saw that is. V. Mm -hmm. So we have V plus W at V at B. All right, OK. OK, now from here, what we have? And we know that, so this, I want to get this formula explicitly. So I have F at, if V is equal to 0, I have 0, 0, U, is exactly alpha at V at U. This one. And we know this element belongs to the z axis, so this is a translation. And that this is exactly 0, 0, u plus some constants. That's what we proved in part uh, two. 3 or 2? Two? 2, no, 3. No? Okay. This, this is that we have v of u is exactly u plus some constants. So if you put back inside, you have If you put inside, it's done because now. What's written there is just uh, x of u plus c v. Okay. Okay. So were there alternative solutions? Anybody found some? Yeah, I found that uh, if we change u if minus u, we mm -hmm. also find that it is also uh, isometry. If u is minus if u. If u maps to minus u. It's also yes. But no, no, it's it's not reflection. I think it's a, a, a it's a rotation uh, in the x-axis mm. by one hundred and eighty degree. Because uh, u is also in other sides. It's not it's not reflection because u is also in because u so uh -huh. v is in my so so 
So it's, I think it's a rotation. Well, it's a composition of the two, no? Because u goes to minus u, it's the reflection in the z-axis. Yes. But at the same time, in the xy plane, you are doing something, no? No, I think only only u uh, to minus u. It's all the rotation. The rotation where then? The rotation uh, in the x-axis. So come to the blackboard because I mean, in the x-axis, I don't know what it means. He's saying that this axis, you are rotating like this. Uh, if you are rotating like that. Then it's v. Uh, we we rotate everything in the uh, z-axis. V to minus v. Okay, sorry. Co uh, what what were you arguing? Okay, it's a map change with the minus u. Mm -hmm. Then we get that uh, v because uh, u minus v sin u minus u. But if it's the reflection, uh, this must not say. Uh, but if, if this is a reflection, then uh, the minus must not be here. Right. But, but so uh, I give that this is uh, a rotation in the x-axis. Sorry, I don't know what it is. A rotation in the x-axis. Uh, I mean, uh, it's, uh, uh, okay. No, but in, uh, suppose just let's, uh, let's draw it. I mean, you, you have R3. So first, I don't know why you are keeping, I mean, what, at which point this should be relevant in, in, in this exercise. Because uh, this only without minus. So I think, yeah, minus is also, so it's, uh, there are another isometry is out of this. OK. So you, are, you want to say that this is up to something. I mean, so there are this family and another family. Yes. Okay, but now what you wrote, so geometrically takes this point where? I mean, so, so this is x, y, and z. So it's uh, minus this, and, uh, and then uh, it's y, and this uh, here. Uh, yes, it's, it's here, around here. Because uh, this is uh, one, it's, uh, one. Right, so it's a composition of. No, the it's, it's only a rotation in. in uh, well, so the rotation I mean. means it's something going like this? Yes, or something. So it's a rotation where the axis depends on the point. The axis is here, so, axis is here, so it's rotation. So, uh, so if this is the cylinder, then the rotation, something like this. So. OK, we can discuss it later. I mean, the point, in any case, so the point that you are making is where is the reflection gone in this argument? Yeah. OK, now forget, I think you are a bit confused, but it's OK. What is the geometric meaning? But what you are raising, you are raising the question whether we should add here a plus or minus, OK? Yeah, I mean, with, with P. P can also be minus. And also V can be a minus, OK? So let's see, what do you think? But since U and V are changing all for, for the R, uh, it shouldn't matter. Because actually, when I did your school, I got this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, in fact, I think you have to allow this, this freedom. The only point is that probably you are writing twice. I mean, it can happen that you are writing twice the same thing, okay, depending on the way you write. But actually, even in my solution, Ah, no, no, but actually, no. The point is that uh, rotations, I mean, reflection should disappear. I mean, re uh, reflection along the z-axis are not there. So in principle, you leave it here. But then you have to argue that they disappear. 
Okay. Maybe it's still on the blackboard. It's here the point. B of u is not plus or minus u plus c. It's plus u plus c. Okay. So this thing here tells you that actually reflections were not there. Okay. So, so at the end, these are the only isometries. Okay. Well, OK. I mean, of course, I have prepared six exercises, and we have done one. But I hope, <laughs> well, we can also have a, a special lecture on exercises, if you want. Do you think it would be useful? So we will, uh, we will plan it, OK?